Here we are uh, for week eight, and tonight we're going to have lectures 15 and 16. We're going to look at uh, Byzantium, which is uh, the second Rome, or has Rome really fallen? Uh, I haven't told you about the fall of Rome yet, but we will talk a little bit about that before we get into Byzantium. The second lecture will be on Han China, and often Han China, the, the first Chinese, well, the second Chinese empire is compared, often it's compared to the Roman Empire. And so tonight is a good time to talk about that. Are Roman China really a lot alike? Okay. So as we go through looking at the Byzantine Empire, we're going to recall a little bit about the Roman Empire. We're going to talk about did Rome really fall? And uh, then we'll look at Byzantium, which is the second Rome. And so that you can be thinking about, as we go through the two lectures, are Rome, are Rome and China really alike? So we'll do a little bit of review. The first thing I want to do, OK, we've got, our, we've got our cover slide here. The first, oh, why is he here? OK. <laughs> um, OK, we ended last time. We were talking about Diocletian and Constantine. And Diocletian was um, the person who really began the formation of the Second Rome. Uh, remember that Diocletian uh, took over the empire after it had fallen apart. But it didn't fall. There were a lot of rebellions. The European provinces, part of them were lost. Uh, Diocletian pulled Rome back together. First of all, he issued the Edict of Maximum Prices. And what he did was to put price controls on everything. He uh, reformed the army, breaking it up into uh, essentially two units that formed in the um, uh, uh, armies that were stationed in the provinces. And he had a mobile army that moved around in case there were problems anywhere. He divided the empire into dioceses before under the, under the early empire, Rome was divided into provinces. They were very large. And you remember that, that a lot of the provincial governors formed their own private armies, some of whom marched on Rome. OK, this is what Diocletian wanted to prevent. So he broke up the provinces into a much smaller district called dioceses. Is that a familiar word to you? Uh, you heard that word before? <laughs> yeah, anybody? The Catholic Church calls its districts, its administrative districts, dioceses. Well, this is where they got it um, from the Roman Empire under Diocletian. He made all jobs hereditary. So for the first time in Rome, you have the end of social mobility. The up, up until the time of Diocletian, there was almost complete social mobility in the Roman Empire. And now it's gone. He also divided the empire into four large units. And he instituted a system of Augusti and Caesari so that he put two Augusti, taking the name from the Emperor Augustus, and the two Augustuses, or Augusti, each ruled one of the Roman provinces. And they had two lieutenants called Caesare. So each Caesar, or Caesar, ruled another of the provinces. So the empire was divided into four parts. And each of those four parts had a ruler. This, the the uh, plan was that at a certain date, at a set date, actually in 305 AD, the Augusti were supposed to retire and step down. The two Caesari would then step up and become Augusti, and they would, and the empire would elect or appoint new Caesari. Well, it didn't work. Of course, the, uh, nobody wanted to retire. The two Caesari went to war against each other, and Rome was plunged into a civil war again. So Diocletian's scheme, he did, he did pull the empire back together, but only temporarily uh, and, well, for a long time, actually. He pulled it back together, but his scheme, his political scheme, didn't work. And here are the four different parts of the empire ruled by the Caesari and the Augusti. Okay. 
Uh, the civil wars were won by Constantine, and, the, and, and so that we can talk about uh, a, a lot of uh, events that happened with Constantine. Um, he completed the reformulation of the empire. Okay, the empire fell apart in the third century under the third century anarchy. It was pulled back together first by Diocletian and then by Constantine, and it was under Constantine that Christianity succeeded. Christianity was touch and go for a long time, and uh, we talked last time about the fact that Christianity succeeded because of Constantine. Okay, I, I, had, um, I had saved uh, on the wrong place, and so my, um, I'm going to have to write again, which I didn't do last time, but I have some articles to show you again, okay? The first one is, well, it's not writing. Oh, okay. Oh, now it works, okay. Okay, Herod's reputation enhanced by ancient seaport findings. And this is from the Houston Chronicle, 1988. <laughs> okay, um, in 1988, uh, there was a book published called King Herod's Dream, and it's the publication of all the excavations that were got, done in the seaport of Caesarea. And um, the archaeologists who excavated it discovered that it was a huge, rich, wealthy port, and um, and it justified what Josephus said about King Herod building the biggest port in all antiquity that was even bigger than Athens. Um, and um, the, two, the authors are Holum, Holfelder, Hol Bull, and Rabban, but they wrote this book called King Herod's Dream. If you want to look that up. The dimensions of the harbor astonished archaeologists. At least 100 ships could anchor in it, and it surpassed Piraeus, the port of Athens. Okay. Uh, Herod was a very great king. He, he uh, ruled over an enormously economical, uh, economically successful uh, uh, state in Judea. Uh, but Caesar Augustus once observed, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. And the reason he said that was because Herod was a Jew and he didn't eat pork, but he killed three of his sons who plotted against him. So he was a very ruthless ruler. You all remember who Herod was in the Bible. So this huge port. Um, Rabban said the correspondence between Josephus' text and the archaeological findings was so exact that they had been able to reconstruct the original design of the harbor in surprising detail. And interestingly, the two major crops that they traded in were salt, which was taken from the Dead Sea, and pepper, which was brought all the way from India. And so these were the major crops that were, um, that were shipped through that port. Okay, let me mention a second newspaper article, and this is the Jesus inscription. which you may have heard about it, an inscription on stone, maybe the earliest ever found. And this is from the New York Times, October 2002. They found a tomb with the inscription that said, Son of Joseph, Brother of Jesus. And it caused a huge stir in 2002, but the upshot is it was a fake. Okay, so if you run across that article, the inscription has been proved a fake. Uh, the third article I have for you has to do with our uh, topic today, and this is um, February, New York Times, February 
2001. And this is DNA shows malaria helped topple the Roman Empire. Okay, and the gist of this article is that there's a hypothesis that a widespread outbreak of an especially lethal form of malaria in the 5th century AD probably contributed to the decline of the Roman Empire. On the other hand, the epidemic may have saved Rome from a sacking at the hands of Attila the Hun, whose fear of the fevers may have caused him to turn back short of the city. So whatever the case, whether it saved Rome from being sacked by Attila or whether it caused the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, DNA tests on bodies found in a 5th century uh, cemetery in Rome have shown that they had a huge malaria outbreak. And the malaria, interestingly, is the result of the empire, the Roman Empire, because it's an African strain that's particularly virulent of malaria. It was brought into Sicily uh, by Roman trade, and there it went, underwent some, um, some mutations and then it was finally brought to Rome, and the area around Rome on the Tiber River is very swampy and perfect place for malaria mosquitoes, and sure enough, the city of Rome was infested with malaria in the fifth century. Okay, we'll see how this fits into what possibly could have happened when we talk about the so-called decline and fall of Rome. But when we look at Rome in the time of Constantine and the success of Christianity, the Roman Empire is put back together. And the Roman Empire under Constantine is the beginning of the Byzantine Empire. Okay, this is, this is the formation of the uh, Byzantine Empire. Constantine won against his major opponent, Maximian. He won the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312. And he already had Christian bishops in his army uh, accompanying him. And those Christian bishops told him that if he carried a standard that had the chi rho on it, and I'll show you what the chi rho looks like in a moment, but it's a symbol that with the two first letters in the word Christ in, in the Greek alphabet, if he carried a, a standard with that symbol on it, he would win the battle. Uh, and. Uh, Actually, it's not surprising that Constantine had Christian bishops in the army because his mother, St. Helena, who was British, uh, was already a Christian. And so he had, he, his mother was a Christian, and so this um, had something to do with, with uh, Constantine being the one who, who um, uh, caused the success of, uh, success of Christianity. Uh, he contributed to the great economic revival of the Roman Empire by reforming the coinage. In the third century in Rome, in the third century anarchy, in the third century is the 200s, the economy completely broke down because Rome was infused with civil wars. Civil wars going on everywhere. The whole economy broke down. And so uh, Constantine and Diocletian put it all back together. And reforming the coinage was very important because the coins became virtually worthless. Uh, instead of having solid gold or solid silver coins, uh, people cast coins out of lead and then, and then just put a thin wash of gold or silver over them, kind of like the coins we have in America now. We don't have solid gold or silver coins anymore. We have that kind of coin. Well, what he did was to make the church a corporation. And a corporation, as some of you know, is a legal person. And so what this meant was, since the church was a corporation, uh, it never dies. A corporation lives forever. And a corporation can hold property, and a corporation can inherit property from other people. And so this is one of the very important things that meant the growth of the Christian church. Also, Constantine made it exempt from taxes. So the church did not have to pay any taxes. And at the same time, Constantine granted a lot of monetary support to the churches by taking it away from the pagan religions. He took the state support away from all the pagan religions, all of them, and gave state support to the Christian churches. 
He also chose Christian bishops as officials in his government, so that all, a lot of them would serve as governors within the Roman government. Um, and so this had the impact of helping Christianity survive. Eusebius of Caesarea was a Christian writer, and you have two readings actually by Eusebius. You have a life of Constantine that describes Constantine in Eusebius's words, and you have, um, and you, I think you have part of his history of the of the church as well. The oration to Constantine is sometimes called the life of Constantine, but what it is is declaring um, Constantine almost a god in himself, that Constantine is the great savior and the great hero of the Christian church. And one of the things Eusebius says is, Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God. Okay, tell me what that means here. <laughs> What does that say? Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God, yeah. Well, Christ is God's right hand, and so Constantine would be Christ's right hand enforcing. No, Christ is God. Remember the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Christ is God. So if you say Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God, you're saying Constantine is God. This is heresy. This is outright heresy, and everybody knew it. Nevertheless, they were, the church was so grateful to Constantine that these are the kinds of things people were saying. Uh, this, this kind of a system, Constantine governed the entire church. He ran the church. He made rules for the church. He made laws for the church. He is the one who called the Council of Nicaea, and at that council of bishops and churchmen, that's where they chose the books who were, that were going to be part of the Bible. And the Council of Nicaea was also where the Nicene Creed was written, which formulates the basic principles of Christianity. I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't say the whole thing for you. But, but this is the, um, Constantine was making the rules for the church. The church was syncretic. Uh, it was eclectic. It had, we saw the church develop from a, almost a blank slate because Jesus didn't give any directions about how to build the church. And we saw it develop by arguing out over time the um, principles of Christianity. And in the process of that, the church became more and more Roman. So as the Roman Empire became Christian, the Christian church became more Roman. It was eclectic, and it gathered a lot of Roman traditions into uh, the beliefs of the church. Okay, here's the Cairo. I promised I would show you that. And here is the Arch of Constantine. It's very, the, the Arch of Constantine is extremely interesting because a lot of it is classical and a lot of it is late Roman because he pasted a lot of different things on it. He, too, he stole a lot of things from other monuments and put them on the Arch of Constantine. Okay, here, for example, is a Roman Corinthian um, uh, temple, the Temple of the Sun, from the time of the classical Roman Empire, and now architecture changes dramatically. Um, we see the building of the very first Christian churches, and they're built in the style of late Roman architecture. Okay, this is the Basilica of Constantine. Now, nowadays, Basilica means church, but in the time of Constantine, Basilica meant building. I mean, it was, the, it was the civic building of Constantine, the hall of Constantine where he, where he carried on the government. This is the time, in the time of Constantine, that the very first Christian churches were built. There were no Christian churches at all before the time of Constantine. Oh, they were, I, I won't say at all, there were house churches, but actually building buildings and calling them churches. This is the first time it happens. And they model them after the Basilica of Constantine. Let's go back to this and we see the exterior of a classical Roman building with all the decoration on the outside of it. The inside is perfectly plain on the inside. And what you see is Roman artistic values turned inside out, okay? 
Now we see a very plain exterior or outside to the building and all the richness and decoration is on the inside. And the reason for this is because Christian values have permeated Rome. Uh, the idea is that it's not the outer man, the man uh, like the Greco-Roman ideal or the ideals of the Roman soldiers that we saw in the time of early Rome, that, that great deeds and great heroism and great reputation was what Roman men tried to do. It was, what, it was the face you showed to everyone else that was important, the outer shell of the person. With Christianity, it's the inner man that's important. The interior being and the outer shell is that is just that, it's a shell, and so it doesn't matter anymore. So you see values turned inside out. Here's one of the very first um, churches, St. Peter's Basilica, and there's the plan of the basilica, um, like Constantine's uh, basilica. And here's the plan of St. Peter's in the Middle Ages as well. Okay, here is a, a, the hall of an Egyptian temple that's been converted into a church. Okay, you see a, a, a grand uh, explosion of church building in the Roman Empire. Here's the mausoleum of Constantia, who was a Christian, the daughter of a Christian emperor. And you see a gigantic building, again, very plain on the outside, and this is the interior that is so grand and glorious, beautiful, covered with colored mosaics, and it, it's an exquisite building. And here you can see the inside of Santa Costanza in Rome, uh, where you can get an idea of the glory of the interior of this. Okay, there's a great intellectual change in the Roman Empire incorporating the classics. The problem is that when you read Tertullian, it was one of your readings that you had, where he really wanted to reject all of the Roman classics. He wanted to reject Plato and Aristotle and Epicurus and Cicero. And a lot of people who had grown up with a Roman education found this extremely difficult to deal with because they loved the, the Roman church. For example, St. Jerome, when he was very ill uh, one time, and St. Jerome was a really good Christian and he knew he had to give up all of his classic education, but he loved it so much he became very ill. And, and deliriously went into a, a coma of some kind and he had a terrible nightmare actually where he, he was dying and he went, be, he had died and he went before the throne of God and God said to him, who are you? And he said, well, I am a Christian. And God thundered back at him, no, you're not, you're a, you're a Ciceronian because you love Cicero. And so um, uh, this is the, cl it was very difficult for the educated Christians to give up the Greco-Roman classics. They solved this dilemma by the use of allegory. Now, I don't know that the Christians actually invented allegory, but they used it very extensively. And one of the problems with the, with the Old Testament was that it was full of earthy stories about peasants. It was about peasant shepherds herding their sheep, and it was about peasant women gleaning in the field, and it was about uh, uh, sheep herders who traveled from place to place, and poor uh, people of the soil, okay? And the Romans, the Roman intellectuals said, how can you tell us that these are people who have the wisdom of God in these books about these peasants? Uh, there's no wisdom in these books. And so St. Jerome and St. Ambrose actually solved this problem by the use of allegory. And so they used allegory. Uh, allegory is where you take a, a simple story like um, a shepherd herding his flock and you say, well, you, you don't look at the surface meaning of the story. You look at the symbolism of the story and what it represents. So the shepherd herding his sheep represents God taking care of his people. Um, there's a story of Rebecca at the well, which is a good illustration where uh, she is described as having earrings and necklaces and bracelets. And the early Christians were not allowed to wear earrings, necklaces, and bracelets. and so. It was all explained as an allegory that her earrings were 
the earrings of, of her good deeds and the necklaces of her purity and her goodness and her, and her good behavior. And so these were symbolic interpretations. And this is how, this is how the um, Christians uh, bridge the gap between classical knowledge and the knowledge of, uh, and, and the literature of Christianity. And so this became a very exciting enterprise how, how and intellectuals rushed into the church to see how they could blend together the wonderful Greco-Roman classical knowledge and explain it in the terms of Christianity. The crowning achievement of this was done by St. Augustine of Hippo. And St. Augustine of Hippo wrote two important books. I, I, you have one reading from St. Augustine of Hippo. He wrote The Confessions, which is a simple story of his path to God and how through the experiences of his life, he moved from being a, a sinful baby with the sin of Adam that he had, and he progressed slowly and learned all the truths of Christianity. He converted late in life, and um, the rest of the book is his revelations from God about the truths of Christianity. And this became a handbook of the Middle Ages. This was extremely important. Some people say that with Augustine writing the Confessions and the City of God, now we're dealing with the Middle Ages, that Augustine is the foundation of the Middle Ages. On the other hand, people who say that the Romans produced no, no major philosophy at all, no great philosophers like the Greeks did, they are uh, countered by the argument that St. Augustine was the great philosopher of the Roman world. And the City of God is that great philosophical work. Uh, the City of God takes Roman history and Roman stories and turns them inside out and upside down. You remember the story of the rape of Lucretia. Remember that Lucretia was raped against her will and even though she was innocent, that she was not her fault, she was raped, she committed suicide in order to save her husband's reputation. So that was the story with which Rome was founded, and, and it was the rape of Lucretia that drove the Romans to drive out uh, the Etruscan kings from Rome. Okay, an example of how St. Augustine turned Roman history upside down is how he reinterprets the story of the rape of Lucretia. And he says, Lucretia was perfectly innocent. She was not innocent of the, uh, of, of the rape. She was completely exonerated. And in fact, she still remained a virgin because she did not consent to the rape. On the other hand, she's guilty of murder because she committed suicide and what she did was to murder her innocent self. She murdered an innocent person, which was Lucretia. And so this, this has two impacts on Christianity. It was written at a time when the Visigoths were sacking the city of Rome in 410 and a lot of Christians were raped. And so he told this story so that they would not commit suicide. And the second thing he did, in essence, he said, these young women were innocent of any crime. And in fact, they were still virgins because they did not consent to the rape. Secondly, it is the key ruling in the Christian church against suicide, that suicide is an act of violence. Uh, it is a, the crime of murder against yourself, and this is the argument that he makes. So this is the birth of the medieval worldview. So can we say that Rome falls with St. Augustine? Well, we might. We might if we can say Rome falls at all. Here is St. Jerome, and he is the one. That, this is a late uh, picture of St. Jerome, a later picture of St. Jerome and his dream. And here is a 15th century portrait of St. Augustine. We don't, in fact, know what either Jerome or Augustine actually really looked like. OK, decline and fall. There are a hundred theories about the fall of Rome. Did it decline? Did it fall? Was it murdered or was it transformed? Um, 
Gibbon, Edward Gibbon wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire in 1776, and he describes Rome as being formed in the Roman Empire at 14 AD, which is the time of the Emperor Augustus. And it was a steady decline from that point forward until 1453 AD, okay? 1,500 years of decline. Wouldn't we in America love to know that we're going to decline for a thousand more years? Uh, this would be a great triumph at the rate we're going right now. We'll never make it, but um, can you call this a decline if it lasts a thousand years? So there's something wrong with the premise of Gibbon. Gibbon argued that the seeds of the fall of the Rome are in the creation of the empire, that its very creation meant that someday it would fall and that eventually it fell of its own weight. That's one theory Gibbon has. The second theory is that the sacred indolence of the monk, mur monks murdered uh, the good old Roman values. And what, what Gibbon said was Rome completely changed. It gave up its wonderful Greco-Roman classic values of heroism and war and reputation and fame and, and um, glory that the Romans uh, admired. You know, the old values they had when they founded the city of Rome, the the, the values of Mucius, Scaevola, and Cincinnatus, and, and the great heroes of Rome. And instead, Rome adopted um, habits of monks, retiring from the world, sitting and praying all day instead of going out and being a hero and fighting. Okay, and it was these values that murdered the Roman Empire. Well, there are problems with the concept of decline and fall. A French historian at the time of Gibbon made the comment that Rome, being neither up nor down, cannot fall. And so uh, what we have is a faulty concept of historical change. You also have to look at the problem of decline, the problem of golden ages and ages of decline. If you say the golden age of Rome was the second century, which Gibbon did, then you have to say that everything after that was downhill. And this means that the golden age of Rome is the glorious high point and Christianity is a decline and fall, okay? And which is what Gibbon actually says. So those of you who are Christian might wanna say, wait a minute, Christian Rome, we might wanna call that the golden age instead of the second century. Um, uh, so was the Christian Empire an age of decline? Well, it depends on your point of view. Um, certainly the old Roman values were lost and there's a transformation into new medieval values. Now we have to uh, cope with the word medieval for a minute too. Uh, medieval is a word coined by Italians in the Italian Renaissance and they coined that word to say because they recognized that Rome was gone. They looked around them and they, and they said, a long time ago, once upon a time, there was a glorious Roman civilization here. It's gone, it's not here anymore, but we are going to revive it and revive the glory of Rome. So what happened in the thousand years between? Well, those are the Middle Ages. And so then they went further and they labeled it a thousand years of Gothic darkness, Gothic meaning German. And so this is where the myths come of the Germans murdering the Roman Empire. Well, there are some other theories about the fall of Rome. Ernst Kissinger said Rome became medieval before it became Christian. He is an art historian, and if you look at the Roman art, you see that it changes drastically. It's no longer realistic and photographic in about the second century. By the third century, it has become very symbolic. The perspective is gone. It's a very different kind of art. H.P. Lorange, in his Art Forms in Civic Life and Late Antique Rome, does the same thing with buildings. Uh, Kissinger looks at, at paintings and he looks at sculpture. H.P. Uh, Lorange looks at buildings and he says, well, I, I gave you his theory. The outsides were elaborate and the insides were plain in the Roman Empire and in the Christian Empire, the outsides are plain and the insides are, are uh, elaborate. Peter Brown in the world of late antiquity says there is an intellectual change, a change of mentality where 
in the old days, the Romans avoided cemeteries and death, and they were very interested in, in the, the life in the present world. In the medieval world, now life centers around the, the cemeteries, and people are looking to saints as the bridges between heaven and earth. And what he's saying is that life became much more spiritual, that the values were more spiritual, and people were looking to the afterlife. Yet another theory, uh, and, and, and that would have been in the fourth and fifth century that that change took place. Yet another theory is by Henri Perrin. Without Mohammed, there would have been no Charlemagne. And it's Henri Perrin who argues that it's the rise of Islam that means the end of the Roman Empire. That, in fact, um, Islam spread across the Mediterranean Sea and cut off the trade in the Mediterranean. And the essence of the Roman Empire, we've seen our maps of the Roman Empire where it's a circle around the Mediterranean Sea, and that cutting off the Mediterranean and uh, cutting off the northern part of Europe from the Mediterranean meant the end of Rome because there's no longer that Mediterranean unity. It left Europe high and dry, and Europe had to develop its own culture. And that's what is the end of Rome and the beginning of the Mediterranean. Uh, other historians, and there are so many, I won't go through them all, but other historians say just right, they right out say the Germans murdered Rome. They conquered it. Um, and so I'm going to argue against that. Uh, actually, uh, the evidence is that they didn't actually conquer Rome. What happened was Rome pretty much disintegrated, leaving a power vacuum, and the Germans spread into, migrated. They didn't conquer, but they migrated in that area to fill the vacuum. At the same time, there were other changes going on in Roman culture. Uh, because Rome was now Christian. And one of the things that happened was the rise of monasticism. And this began with St. Antony and the Desert Fathers, people who wanted to get closer to God. And this, is, this has to do with the spiritual world that Peter Brown talks about, where people wanted to get closer to God and they were more interested in being spiritual heroes than they were being warlike heroes. St. Antony and the Desert Fathers went out in the desert to be alone and walled themselves up in, ca in caves and became very holy men who did nothing but pray to God all day. A people came to, be, to gather around them because they were so holy and asked them to preach uh, to them as holy men. And, and so other people settled around them into monastic communities. And this is how monasticism began. Um, in the deserts of Egypt, for example. Okay, here's the interior. Uh, we see this inner, inner life uh, in, in architecture. And here we see a more classical view of Roman art that becomes ever more stylized and symbolic. This is the sculptures on the arch of Constantine stylized and symbolic instead of photographic. Okay, and here we see a plain exterior of, this is a cell of St. Saba. St. Saba was one of these uh, um, monks who walled himself up in a, in, in a cave. And this is the, the little cell that he lived in all his life. Okay, and, and again, compare the plain exterior with the, with the um, elaborate interior here. Uh, here's a sarcophagus in the Lateran Museum, and the art is becoming more stylized, more um, less realistic and less photographic, and that's medieval art. Um, and we're, we're entering a different world if we look at the art, a world where Jesus is the teacher and he is the, um, uh, he's the center of spiritual life, okay. I forgot to mention one other thing about um, St. Augustine's City of God. Um, we have to, I, I want to mention one other thing because what St. Augustine writes is a new view, view of history. He reinterprets history, not only all Roman history with Christian values, but he also reinterprets the meaning of history. The, the title of the City of God 
is a city on the hill that, the, that everyone is striving for. He says there are two cities. There's the city of man and the city of God. And, and the city of man is where we live in this world. The city of God is the eternal city, the city of Jerusalem, the second Jerusalem that we're all striving for. Uh, and he also says that empires may rise and fall, but it doesn't matter. Everybody was going around saying, oh, Rome is falling, this is the end of the world. But St. Augustine says it doesn't matter if the Roman Empire falls. What matters is the individual's progress toward God. And history is linear. He's taking up this Jewish idea that history is linear. History follows one event after another on a straight road that leads forward and upward. It's the idea of progress, that we're all living through history, heading toward the second coming and the city of God, and the um, uh, progress toward a utopian future when everybody would, would live in a Christian world as Christians. Okay, so this is the medieval worldview. Okay. It, what it is, is a paradigm shift, um, a shift in mentality in the way people perceive the world. Uh, it's now no longer the world of the living, but the afterlife and the inner man rather than the outer world, the spiritual world rather than the actual world, and symboli symbolism rather than realism. There's also an eastward shift. Okay, one of the things that Constantine did was to found a new capital city, and this is the city of Constantinople. Okay, uh, this is a city that Constantine called New Rome, and it's even east of Rome itself. I have a map that shows where it is, but here we can see Diocletian. Um, uh, maybe we'll come to that in a moment, but Diocletian made these major changes in the way Rome was organized. Diocletian took a new title as emperor, and that title was Dominus. Dominus means master, as in master over slaves. Remember that Augustus had taken the title of princeps senatus, first citizen, first in the Senate, in the Senate first among equals. Here is a new concept of the emperor as dominus, as in master over slaves. That is more of an Eastern Persian concept. The emperor is more separated from the people, and now his followers come in and they're bowing and scraping on their, on their knees as the throne is rising into the air. Eastern pomp and ceremony is, um, is becoming dominant and, and Another thing is that as the emperor, well, I'll go back to that map. Okay, Constantinople is founded as New Rome, and it's a replica of Rome. Old Rome still existed, but Constantinople, which is, I can't show you exactly where it is. If you look in the yellow portion of that map under the Black Sea, it's just where the two land masses come together there. We should come to that in a moment. Uh, and so what we have is a new synthesis that is shifted toward the eastward. The Roman Empire, it's as if the Roman civilization retreated eastward and just abandoned the West. And always remember that Europe had been less developed than the rest of the Roman Empire. Spain was very developed, but Europe, and that's mostly the area of France and Spain, was the least developed part of the empire, and it's as if it's as if the Constantine shifted the empire eastward and the east just abandoned the west. And now you have a new synthesis. The Greco-Roman culture is now blended together with Judeo-Christian because it's the Christian Roman Empire. And then you have a lot of Persian influence from the east. And so you have a new kind of culture blended together from all those different influences. And in time, uh, the Eastern Romans, and this is Byzantium. Byzantium is the Eastern Roman Empire. Rome did not fall. It continued in the east as Byzantium. Uh, 
with uh, Justinian was the last Latin speaking emperor and everybody switched to Greek. So here's a Byzantine manuscript and it's written in Greek. Greek becomes the official language of the Roman Empire. Okay, we've already done that Eastern shift. Here's the map I was looking for. Constantinople is just within that square far to the Greek east of the Roman Empire. Okay, and it's, it's a Christian empire. It's Rome in a new guise, in a new phase. It's a Christian Roman empire. The new synthesis, Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian, Judeo and Persian. Rome was divided under the emperors Honorius and Arcadius, who were brothers. It, it was divided into east and west, never to be united again. In 410, the city of Old Rome was sacked by the Visigoths, and that was the point where St. Augustine wrote the City of God. And here we now have a throne that the emperor sits on that didn't exist in the Old Roman Empire. This is a Byzantine throne. Here are some Byzantine emperors who are now Dominus rather than Princeps Senatus. Theodosius II built walls around Constantinople or New Rome. In 410, uh, he ignored the, the old city of Rome being sacked and he just built walls around New Rome. And New Rome was now the ruling city. There was a great palace in there with the Hall of Silence. The Hippodrome was where the horse races were run. And um, Rome, even though it was, compl it was a dominate now, it was ruled very autocratically by the emperors. And here are two Byzantine um, uh, portraits of emperors. Even though it was autocratically ruled by autocratic emperors, still there was a hint of democracy there um, still remaining, okay? And here is the Byzantine Empire leaving behind the West and abandoning the West, okay? And the walls around the city of Rome. Here's the view across the Bosporus from Europe to Asia, the site of New Rome, the ruling city and it was the most Christian empire. Uh, now we have the Patriarch of Constantinople as the right-hand man of the emperor. The Patriarch of Constantinople is uh, the Byzantine head of the church, but there are other patriarchs in the Byzantine empire. There are patriarchs in, in um, Alexandria, for example. There are patriarchs in Antioch. So he's not the only patriarch, and this limits his power to a certain extent. Um, so it's the most Christian empire. Again, this is Byzantine. The Greek influence is predominant with Rome in a new guise. Uh, the circus factions retain a little bit of democracy because although the emperor comes and he sits and he presides over the game, over the games, and which are now horse races, they stop, um, they stop killing people in the arena because they're Christians now and murder is frowned on by Christians and so they have horse races. But the, 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 racing, um, the racing companies that have these um, uh, factions of uh, 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 their, um, they're not, uh, what do we want to call them, their stables. Okay, the stables are named the greens and the blues and the reds and the whites. So they're different stables of horses and they become the political factions. They're, they're the, the kind of headquarters. Each one, around each one is our political parties, different factions that want different elements of the government. And so when they come together in the um, Hippodrome for the horse races, uh, the crowd will chant, um, will chant sayings like um, uh, we want or, or uh, of the questions of the day and the great questions of the day are all religious like is God uh, fully human or 10% human and 90% divine or 50% human or 50% divine and people would come into the Hippodrome and they would chant one way or the other. And this was the political issue of the day that, that they were dealing with. So you see this little element of democracy that still survives, even though democracy is pretty dead by this time. It, it dies in the second century, in the second, third century anarchy. Uh, and here is the emperor presiding over the games, and you can see the horse races below in, in the emperor above presiding over the games and the horse races below. 
There are differences between the Eastern and Western monasticism in uh, here is Theodosius. Okay, we'll catch up with our pictures. Here's the Emperor Theodosius, uh, who builds walls around Constantinople. And here's a mosaic of the 6th century. Um, uh, it was typical Byzantine art. Okay. Differences between East and West. We've already mentioned St. Anthony of the Desert. Uh, in the West, the, the desert monks win out. And so in the West, monasticism means that you retreat to the wilderness and live all by yourself if you want to be a monk. In, in the West, monasticism centers in the countryside away from the centers of power. In the East, it takes a very different form. In the East, you have pillar saints who actually build pillars in the middle of the city and go on top of them and sit on them and live there their whole life. Okay, but they, they, they retreat from, the, from society, but they still play a role in society because they act like the dear abbeys of their day. Everybody comes to them for advice and comes to ask them, well, how should I live my life and how should I deal with the, with the problems of my life? My child is having problems in school. What should I do about it? My husband is cheating on me. What should I do about it? And, and so they become the advisors to the people of the town. And so monasticism in the Byzantine Empire is part of a civic movement. And the monks in the monasteries become the retirement homes, and they become the fire brigades, and they become the hospitals, and they become civic units of the cities of the East. And you have to remember that the eastern part of the empire is the part of the empire that's filled with cities. All the cities are in the east. The only city in the west of any consequence is Rome. Most of the other cities are in the east, so the eastern empire is an empire of cities. There are patriarchs in all of the cities, like Alexandria, Antioch, and Constantinople. Uh, they're not equal to each other. The patriarch of Constantinople is supreme, but he has rivals. Whereas in the western part of the empire, there's only one patriarch, and that's the Pope of Rome. By the 400s, the concept of the papacy in the West emerges. In the Byzantine Empire, we have Hellenistic culture. And we've already seen what Hellenistic culture was like in the time of, of um, Alexander. It's still that Hellenistic culture, a melting pot culture where all the cultures blend together and you have a you have a um, layer of Greco-Roman uh, aristocracy ruling over everything. And it's xenophobic in the East, so that uh, Christians hate all strangers, they're suspicious of them, and they fight against them. Uh, it, it's a city culture, blending a lot of cultures together. In the West, it's mostly rural and agricultural and very, very poor. All the wealth is in the eastern part of the empire. So you see why they leave the West behind. And in this time, we have the golden age of Roman law. Okay, the Theodosian Code is the first time that Roman law is all pulled together and collected in one body of law. So this is the first time law is brought together. And um, uh, we see in the third and fourth centuries, finally, the Justinian Code, which we're going to see in a moment. Here are some Greek um, Aramites. Uh, they're they're uh, the pillar saints that we were talking about um, in their community. And here are the cities of the Eastern Empire. This is Alexandria, okay, and Greek. Again, Greek is predominant. The two greatest emperors of the time are Anastasius, who ruled from 491 to 518, and Justinian from 572 to 565. And under these two empires, um, the Byzantine Empire reached the heights of statecraft and culture. The greatest historian in the time of Justinian was Procopius, who wrote two histories, actually. They're very interesting because the first history he wrote was the history of the wars. And Justinian fought a lot of wars. He was very Roman in that way. 
And so Procopius wrote a history of all of Justinian's wars. And then he fell out of favor, and Justinian threw him out of the court. So then he wrote a secret history telling all the secrets of Justinian and all the bad things he did. So the, the, the history of the wars is all the good things that Justinian did, and the secret history is all the bad things. Priscus was another um, historian who wrote at that time, and he was an eyewitness to the Huns. The Huns were invading at that time. They contributed to the movement of the Roman Empire to the west. And Priscus wrote a history of the Huns. He described their cities, uh, their camps that were not cities. They were made of wood. And so Priscus uh, was praising Attila into his face, said, oh, your glorious camp is so beautiful, how smooth the wood is. And then he would go home to Constantinople, a city of marble. And so um, this is... Uh, a turning point when Attila shows up because now the Byzantines have to develop diplomacy. They can no longer conquer all their enemies. They have to fight them off and part of the way they do it is through diplomatic means and one of the very first diplomats was Olympiodorus of Thebes who traveled all over the Eastern Roman Empire with a parrot on his shoulder that spoke pure Attic Greek. Um, at this time, the Coptics were arising in Egypt, and Coptic Christianity was becoming very strong. Um, there is actually a Coptic church in Houston that still practices the very same Christian rites that come from the third century Rome, Coptic Christian third century rites. This is St. Mark's Coptic Church on Mulberry Lane in Bel Air. And you can go there and you can see the rites of the Coptic church. And one of the interesting, the, the Coptic contribution to the church is the identification of the Virgin Mary as Theotokos, Christ bearer. It's in her body she bore Christ. And so when you go to the um, Coptic church, you'll first you'll see that the men and women sit separate from each other. And so the women stand on one side and the men on the other. There are lots of prayers to the Virgin Mary, who we might connect with Isis as a strong figure in Egyptian, um, in Egyptian culture. And they still pray that the Nile will rise and fall on time. So they still draw on all the Egyptian, um, the Egyptian traditions. Uh, the Syrians uh, contributed trade and music to the empire. It's an eclectic empire gathering all these traditions together. Uh, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 settled the Monophysite controversy, uh, which was about what is the nature of Christ. And I mentioned this to you before. Is Christ fully divine or fully human? Is he 10% human? And 90% divine, how, how human is he and how divine is he? And this is very important to people, especially the Easterners wanted Christ to be fully divine. They wanted him to be um, God. Um, uh, we might look at the monophysite controversy. Mono means single, physis means nature. What kind of a nature did he have? Well, Pope Leo, who was um, the Pope in Rome at the time, made the decision in the controversy. He said that Christ was both fully human and fully divine. You can't divide him up into percentages. He was 100% human and 100% divine. And this was a very important judgment that the Pope made. He actually tried to force it on the Eastern Church and um, the imperial administration in the East wanted consensus and peace. And the Emperor Anastasius answered Pope Leo, he said, you cannot command me to, to um, accept your settlement. Peace I leave with you. You may thwart me, Reverend Sir. You may insult me, but you may not command me. And so what he wanted was a consensus. Um, and it's important that the Western concept of Christ being both fully divine and, both hu and, and human won out because it's, it's extremely important to the further development of Christianity. It meant that Christ's humanity would still be revered. Um, and we'll see that later on. Justinian was the next emperor. And 
Justinian and Theodora marked a great turning point in Byzantine history. Justinian and Theodora ruled together. Uh, she has been called a prostitute or a dancer. Uh, whatever she was, she was an equal partner with him. And in 532, at the great Nica riot, Justinian almost lost control of the empire. And he had to completely reorganize it in order to pull it back together. When he reorganized the empire for the first time, the consulship was abolished. All this time, all these hundreds of years, the consuls had still been elected every year and had been meeting. Now he abolished them and the emperor ruled alone and he was the most Christian emperor. He began a great crusade to the west and in fact Justinian tried to reconquer the western empire. His chief general was named Belisarius. Okay. And, and so here are the conquests of Justinian. He conquered the Ostrogoths in 552. Uh, at that time, the Ostrogoths, these are Germans, were in Italy. They were shattered in 552. He reconquered the coast of Spain in 554. And, he, and in 560, he reconquered the coast of North Africa, which was the most um, prosperous agricultural part of the old Roman Empire. Um, so you see he tried to recreate the Roman Empire so that this is a point where we can say did the Roman Empire fall at this time because Justinian failed to reconstitute the empire. He tried and he failed. One of the reasons that he failed was because there were new migrations coming in from the north and you can see in, in the area of Russia, there are new migrations. Let's just go to this. Well, first, we'll, we'll come to those migrations. But first, Justinian began a great building campaign based on Christian piety and Christian intolerance. And the building campaign, uh, he incorporated a distinctive Byzantine style, uh, decorations with mosaics and frescoes and um, we have two basic architectural plans, a round plan with round buildings, which is Justinian saw that as an imperial style. Uh, and it's, it's kind of based on the Pantheon. Remember the Pantheon was the uh, temple to all the gods. And, and so the round building style is based on the Pantheon. The Basilica plan was based on Constantine's Basilica. Again, the outside is plain and the inside is magnificent, focusing on this Christian idea of the inner person being more important than the outer shell. Justinian then reformed the government and he collected a new legal code, Justinian's Code, and this went beyond Theodosian Code, uh, collecting together and organizing all of Roman law. And so this was a very great achievement. Here's a Byzantine church, the Church of Our Lady at Constantinople, again relatively plain on the outside and magnificent on the inside. I'm so sorry I don't have color pictures to show you, but these are gorgeous, magnificent mosaics with gold background and a, a lot of pictures in them. This is the Basilica style. Um, this is St. Peter's and its, and its annexes uh, in the Middle Ages. And so this is a building in Rome. Um, and many, many churches are built in this Basilica style. Okay, here is the interior of a basilica-style building. Again, elaborate, gorgeous mosaics all over it and columns and, and carvings and, and um, beautiful art on the inside. Here's another one, another basilica. And look at, the, look at the mosaics on the walls and on the floors everywhere. Here's yet another one with the basilica plan and the elaborate interior. And, and so what Justinian did was build these churches all over the Eastern Empire. And part of them were still in the West. Uh, in Italy, there are still places where you can see churches of this kind. Okay, again, the building that he did. There's a revival of art. And again, it's Greco-Roman style architecture. These are church doors. They're bronze doors. You can see on the left the bronze doors with the panels. On the right is one panel of the doors. They're covered with decoration everywhere. Frescoes. Uh, these are. This is in a church in Rome. 
frescoes are wall paintings, and here are more frescoes, okay, that make you, they make you think of icons, the, the Eastern icons, and this is Byzantine architecture in the island of Sicily in Palermo, this is Byzantine. Okay, what stopped the conquest of the West were the great wars with Persia in the late 500s. Persia revived and became strong and attacked the Roman Empire, and the general Belisarius was recalled from Italy. By the way, Belisarius marched up and down Italy and did far more damage than ever the Visigoths did when they wandered around Italy. It was Belisarius that brought Italy to its knees. The renewed Persian Empire in the East was a great turning point because Belisarius came home and fought a great war with Persia, and both empires were fatally weakened. Both of them were just brought to their knees, and so a power vacuum was created. There was no great power in the East at all. Meanwhile, new migrations were coming in from the north, the Slavs, the Bulgars, the Avars, the Khazars, and the Pechenegs, which are wild and woolly people. They didn't write histories about themselves, so all we know is that the Byzantines called them savage barbarians. And this created the environment in which Islam took root. Islam, Mohammed began Islam in 622 onwards in this power vacuum where Byzantium and Persia had exhausted themselves in a great war. And this is when Muhammad appears. With the rise of Islam, and here we see Islam, this is why Islam was able to sweep across the Mediterranean to the west and sweep across Persia to the east, conquering this enormous amount of territory in less than 100 years. And so, with the, we'll, we'll come back to Islam later. With the rise of Islam, Byzantium turns northward, and they, and they send Cyril and Methodius as apostles to the Slavs, going northward. And Cyril and Methodius write down the Slavic language for the first time. The Byzantine Empire here is limited to this little green area. Everything orange and yellow is Muslim conquests. Here's a Byzantine vase. The Asarian emperors ruled from the seven, in the 700s and 800s, and during their time, we have the rise of the iconoclastic controversy. This is an influence of Islam. And I mentioned icons back there a while back that, that one of those paintings looked like icons. Icons are images of Christ and the saints, and people would venerate them, and they would pray to the icons to, to um, uh, um, mitigate between themselves and Christ and God and Mary. And uh, is. Islam, of course, condemns all graven images. And so there was a big controversy in the Byzantine state about whether or not the icons were blasphemy and whether to keep them or not. And in fact, uh, iconoclasm won out. Uh, the Byzantine icons are still prominent in the Byzantine church today, in the Greek Orthodox church today. The Byzantines fought off the Muslims, and they fought them off with a secret weapon, which was Greek fire. And this is a chemical that they fire, that they, they would shoot out onto the water, and when it touched the water, it would burst into flame. And so this was the secret weapon that allowed the Greeks to fight off the Muslims, and the Muslims uh, made their last attempt in the 700s to conquer Byzantium, and then they gave up and turned toward their own uh, development of their empire. Uh, they were followed by the Macedonian empires, who ruled from 867 to 1081. Basil the Bul Bulgar Slayer was the most prominent of those, and he's famous because he fought off the Bulgarians, who were these um, invaders from the north, fighting off the northern and eastern barbarians. Um, at this time, also, here again is, uh, we might think of an icon here, uh, it recalls uh, the style of the icons. 
Um, Charlemagne and the Carolingian Empire began rising in the West as a response to Islam, and here you see Charlemagne's empire, the Yellow Empire, and the Byzantines turned northward to the Slavs. And in this map, the Byzantine Empire is the purple area. Uh, meanwhile, we have movement of more peoples in the north. The Viking invasions began in the 800s at the time of the Isaurian empires and moving into the Macedonian empires. They settled Russia in the 9th century. There you can see Scandinavia and the movement of the Vikings out of Scandinavia westward to the New World, but eastward to Russia. And there they came face to face with the Byzantines. Um, uh, the Rus were the name that the Vikings took as they settled in that region of Russia. They, they intermarried with the Slavs, they ruled over the Slavs, intermarried with them, and created the first, um, the first cities, Kiev, Kiev and Novgorod of Russia, around which the Russian state formed. Um, the Vladimir, the, the leader in 920 of the Rus uh, made the wise decision to convert to Greek Orthodox uh, Christianity. He interviewed um, missionaries from Europe, from, from Roman Catholicism. He interviewed Jewish um, religionists. He interviewed Muslims. And he interviewed the Greek Orthodox ones. And he made the decision to convert to Greek Orthodox religion because because going into their churches, he felt like he had gone into heaven itself with all the beautiful art and gold mosaics glittering at him like jewels and the gorgeous music playing in the background and the incense rising from the censors so that he thought he had gone to heaven itself. This is what the story says that he converted. But probably the reality is that Constantinople was the richest city in all, all of Eurasia at that time, the largest city, the richest city. And his, his Rus Vikings were trading there, and it was a gold mine for him. He actually negotiated a very favorable settlement with trading posts in Constantinople. And um, so consequently, the Russia, the new Russian state, became infused with the Greek Orthodox religion. But Vladimir resisted the influence of the Greek Orthodox. He would not adopt the Greek language, but insisted that the Russian church used the Slavic language, Old Slavonian, so that he was able to maintain his independence. And this was a very shrewd decision on his part. When the Byzantine Empire finally fell, Moscow declared itself the third Rome after 1453 AD. Okay, the Khazars, and here you can see these northern invaders. The, the Khazars are to the right on that map. You can see the Khazars spelled with a CH there. Uh, they became Jews, the Bulgars, and the Pechenegs, and the Turks were other um, invaders that came from the north at this time. The Seljuk Turks arrived from the east around 1050, and they threatened the Byzantine Empire to such an extent that the Byzantines called on the west to save them. And here you can see some more Byzantine art. They called on the west to save them, and they're reduced to this small area. And this is when the Crusades began. Here's more Byzantine art. The First Crusade was in 1096, and the First Crusade was the only successful one. The Byzantines were very disappointed that the Westerners did not want to conquer land from the Turks for them, but the, but the Europeans, the Westerners, wanted land for themselves. And they formed the Crusader states, which you can see on this map along the Holy Land. They only lasted for a hundred years, a little more than a hundred years, the Crusader states. The Crusaders were driven out very swiftly by the Muslims. As soon as the Muslims recovered from the invasion of the Seljuk Turks, they pulled themselves together and drove out the Crusaders. The Crusaders were very unorganized. They didn't have good leaders. They didn't know what they were doing. In 1204, they actually conquered Byzantium itself. 
and Byzantium was fatally weakened. This was the Fourth Crusade. It was the Christians from the West that weakened Byzantium. Here are the Crusaders departing for the Second Crusade. And here are some Crusaders who came. Wave after wave of Crusaders came um, and, and fatally weakened the Byzantine Empire. Here are more Crusaders coming. More Crusaders. <laughs> Okay, and so here is Byzantine art. When Byzantium fell to the West, all the art and literature and, and relics and all the riches of Byzantium poured into Europe and they hastened the development of Europe. And here is some of this beautiful Byzantine art that poured into Europe. Okay, these are ivory figures. Okay. His assaulter of Queen Melisande of Jerusalem in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Finally, in 1453, weakened by the Western conquest of the, of the Fourth Crusade, Byzantium fell to a new wave of barbarians, the Ottoman Turks. But the Ottoman Turks were only able to conquer Constantinople because they had new technology. They had cannons and those impregnable walls only fell to the Ottoman Turks when they were shot down through cannons. So this was the end of the second Rome. Rome fell, if you call it that, in 1453 BC. AD, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, let's take a 15 minute break and when we come back, we'll compare Han China and the Han Empire. <laughs> 